I walk a straight line, shackled and chained. Oh, Goose and Gertie is calling my name. There is no mercy in this penitentiary. Just ask the Hill String Gang, Rango the Three. Welcome back to Bloody Angola, a podcast 142 years in the making. Complete story of America's bloodiest prison. And I'm Jim Chapman. And I'm Woody Overton. We in part two. Part two, baby. Of, of the River, River Parish. She's a killer. Yes. And um, and so we'll just, just real quick, uh, where we left off in part one, uh, course victor rossi october 17th of 1996 was murdered uh on april 9th of 1997 lillian Philippi was found murdered on may 18th of 1997 barbara bourgeois uh was found murdered on uh may 9th of 1997 sam And Luella Acuri found murdered May 14th of 1997. Joan Brock found murdered and July 7th of 1997. The attempted murder of Leonce and Joyce Millett. Uh, And on November 14th of 1997, Daniel Blank finally arrested in Onalaska, Texas. So, we're going to pick up from that point. Right. They bring him back yeah. to Louisiana. This is after he confessed, y'all. And this is, look, these are these are small town detectives. Right. And they got a serial killer mm-hmm. in the back of that vehicle. And one of the, the comments that the detective made was when they pulled into the parish, you had droves of people on both sides mm-hmm. of the road to give you, you know, right. goosebumps and they're cheering right. and these detectives that, you know, this meant something, this community, right. Right. what these guys have done. So they start, you know, obviously you get back and what do you, now you've got this, you know, this guy off the street and you're starting to piece things together at this mm-hmm. point. Um, Just because you make an arrest doesn't mean the case is over by a long shot. You're, yeah. you're going to continue to work and get gain more more evidence to get the prosecution ultimately. And especially one like this where it was – there was no physical evidence. Right. You know, uh, for, I don't know if – I'd say he was smart enough, but for whatever reason, he didn't leave behind fingerprints. Right. He didn't leave behind DNA. Mm-hmm. Uh, which was amazing considering the brutality of yeah, these killings. I would imagine he was gloved up. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was, uh, he, so he, was, he wasn't a dummy. No. Yeah. It, it doesn't mean he was formally educated. He just, he, you know, he was smart. That's right. And so they do, they start investigating it. And guess what they do? Here we go, y'all. Not only um, was he arrested, but. His girlfriend was arrested, and we'll go to an article. It says Destrehan, y'all. That's another uh, town in St. John, I believe. So uh, the article from the AP Wire says investigators have arrested the woman who lived with Daniel Blank in Texas, saying she drove the accused serial killer to the homes of the people he killed and robbed in Louisiana River parishes. Mm. Cindy Bellert. 35 was taken into custody late Monday evening at her sister's home in Destrehan. Bellert, who moved with Blank and their children to Onalaska, Texas, in late July, knew his intent, authorities said. Sheriff Jeff Wiley and them interrupted 
quick. She, I've worked a lot of cases of uh, Jeff Wiley. I think he's a, a, a state senator or something now, rep or, or something like that. But he's he's re- retired from the sheriff, and he's a great guy. But it says Sheriff Jeff Wiley said she was booked into the Ascension Parish Jail on one count of principal to first degree murder, two counts of principal to attempted first degree murder, and principal to aggravated burglary. Blank 35 was booked last week on charges of beating and stabbing to death six River Parish residents from October 1996 to July 1997. He tried to kill two more people in an attack in Gonzales, the authorities said. Authorities said Blank, who robbed to support a gambling addiction, has confessed. It was that gambling habit that eventually cemented the case against Black, Wiley said. In Texas, where Blank was picked up for questioning last Thursday, Polk County Sheriff Billy Ray Nelson Jr. said authorities had been tipped to Blank's lavish spending at Louisiana casinos, including one where Blank was throwing around $100 bills as if he were a wealthy man. One of the houses where he killed, he stole $100 bills, Nelson said. Nelson said authorities weren't expecting a confession when they searched his auto repair shop and home last Thursday. But about eight hours into interrogations, Blank began giving details of the crimes, launching into half-hour accounts of each attack, Nelson said. In one incident, he told investigators how he had killed a woman in her backyard and then dragged her into her home, Nelson said. In, in some cases, Blank told authorities he lurked around the victim's homes for hours before killing them. What he said was just so creepy, Nelson said. Wiley said Blank would hang around the victim's homes in the dark of late night or early morning, hoping the occupants would eventually leave. Unfortunately, the people didn't leave, Wiley said. Leonce and Joyce Millett, both 66 of Gonzales, survived an attack in their home last July. The victims in the other attacks were Victor Rossi, 41, of St. Amal, Barbara Bourgeois, 58, of Paulina, Lillian Philippe, 71 of Gonzalez, Sam Acuri, 76, and Luella Acuri, 69 of Laplace, and Joan Brock, 55 of Laplace. Wiley said Blank often used weapons he found inside his victims' homes. Wiley said he didn't know if Beller would be connected to Blank's alleged crimes in, in other parishes. Efforts to contact other authorities Monday night were not successful. Wiley said Bellert was questioned when Blank was arrested in Alaska. Bellert told investigators that she and the children were returning to Louisiana to stay with her sister and brother-in-law in Destrahan. Investigators always had a strong suspicion that Bellert had helped Blank, Wiley said, adding that it was impossible for her to have lived with Blank for several years without knowing of his crimes. In some cases, Blank stole victims' cars to transport stolen safes, which he took to his home in Paulina to break open, while he said. He said two of the safes have been recovered, one in St. John and one in Ascension. She's living with a man spending a significant amount of money with very little income, while he said. He's gambling, buying a house, tools, setting up a business. Someone living with him had to wonder where all that money was coming from. Right. Right. And Great article. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, that to them was also a piece of a puzzle because remember no physical evidence. Um, So if you're thinking like I'm thinking, and I'm sure Woody's thinking uh, you can look at this girlfriend two ways. You can look at her as a suspect or you can look at her as a witness and they had more value in her as a witness Um, they were concerned. They were concerned because although they had, you know, just tons of circumstantial evidence and cases do get, uh, people do get found guilty, you know, strictly on circumstantial right. in some cases, but it's a, it's a roll of the dice. Right. So what do they do? They go to her and they say, look, we'll go ahead and we'll drop these charges against you. We'll drop them all. But you got to agree to testify against you got to you gotta give up the juice. Right. And, and, you know, certainly she had to know. Absolutely. And so what so, does she do? She says, hell yeah. Because yeah, y'all look, when she, principal two, it means you're just as guilty. Yep. And, and she's looking at every uh, charge that he's looking at and give her, 
give her the out. But yeah, I'm sure it was the prosecutors that are like, hey, you know, what? Well, first of all, hey, they have to agree to drop charges if she testifies, but they needed her to testify. That's right. They they needed it de- desperately in this case. So she agrees. She says, uh, I will testify, and and they say you testify, we'll drop the charges, right. and it'll, it'll be all over with. Whether you agree with that or not, um, I this is a case where I see that they needed they needed yeah. that person. So we're going to fast forward a little bit, and we're going to bring you to. Uh, December 12th of 1998, and this is in the middle of the trial. And um, I, I found this interesting because I, this is centers around the lie detector test. And so I'm going to read you this article. Uh, FBI agent testifies uh, suspect blank failed lie detector test. So an FBI agent testified in court. Wednesday that accused multiple murderer Daniel Blank failed a lie detector test on the day he was arrested in Texas. Near the end of a day-long hearing on a motion to suppress the video and audio tape confessions of Blank, Assistant District Attorney Charles Chuck Long asked FBI agent David Sparks of Houston, Texas, why he questioned Blank after administering the polygraph test to him in Onalaska, Texas, on November of 1997. Sparks said he wanted to find out why Blank had problems with the test. Did you find out, Long asked? No, he didn't tell me why he failed the test, Sparks replied. Defense attorney Glenn Cortello immediately objected, arguing the results of the polygraph examinations are not admissible in court. Long countered that Cortello and his co-counsel, Andy Van Dyke, contended in their motion to suppress evidence that police officers lied to Blank about the results of the test in order to get him to confess. Therefore, Long said he had the right to show Blank failed the test and there was no reason for detectives to lie to him about the results. 23rd Judicial District Judge John Patevin did not immediately rule on the issue. Ascension Parish Sheriff Detective Mike Tony and St. John the Baptist Sheriff Detective Todd Email testified in length Wednesday about the 12 hours they questioned Blank in the six slayings and two attempted murders. In Ascension, Blank is charged with murdering Victor Rossi of Santa Ma and Lillian Philippi, 71 of Gonzalez, and attempting to murder Leonce and Joyce Millett, both 66 at the time they were assaulted on their home in the outskirts of Gonzalez. In St. John, John Parish, he is charged with the killings in Laplace of Joan Brock, 58, and Sam Arcuri, 76, and his wife Luella, who was 69. Yeah, so, so, y'all, they, they, they're trying – the cases in Ascension Parish first. And even though there's six victims, they can't. They, they were, because they were in different parishes, each, that's a different jurisdiction. They, they have to try them separately. Yeah, he's got to answer for all those right. crimes right. Uh, separately. And then, so the very next day, something happens. I guess Daniel Blank was getting a little bit nervous. Right. Uh, you know, the prosecution's putting on a heck of a case. Mm hmm. And this was published on December 11th of 1998. It says, Suspect and Murders Attempts to Escape by John McMillan of the River Parishes Bureau. So, mild-mannered, accused multiple murderer Daniel Blank Thursday broke out a window in a second-floor restroom of the Ascension Parish Courthouse in Donaldsonville and leaped to the ground below where he was a free man for less than a minute. <laughs> now, now, y'all... Y'all take that in. Right. You should had the River Parish's serial killer break out a window and escape. Right. Yeah. For, so for what are you going to tell you how the hell that so happens? With Within 30 to 45 seconds, he was apprehended and back in custody, as Ascension Sheriff Jeff Wiley said. Departmentally, we've responded in a quick fashion, but it shouldn't have happened. There was a security breach here to an extent. Blank, who usually – registers no emotion in his court appearances and is described by his attorneys as very quiet, was being brought into the courthouse for a hearing when the escape attempt occurred. The hearing was on a motion to prevent the use of a videotape confessions he made to six River Parish slayings and two attempted murders. 
Wiley said four correctional officers brought the small, slightly built defendant into the courthouse from the Ascension Parish Prison. The, it's funny, I'm going to interrupt so y'all understand this. So uh, the Ascension Parish Prison is actually outside of Donaldsonville. So Ascension Parish is, is actually split. The Mississippi River splits it. Yeah. Right in half. So the, uh, it has the Sunshine Bridge is what they call it. It goes over to where that – and I've been in that prison many, many times. So handcuffs, leg shackles, and a bulletproof vest were removed from blank in an ante room between the two courtrooms on the second floor of the old courthouse building to make him presentable for court, Wiley said. Uh, after those items were removed, he told officers he had to defecate bad, Wiley said. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Two of them walked him back to an area that's used as a juror room or judge's chambers that has a bathroom. They made a decision to let him take care of his business, while he said. The officers partially closed the bathroom door, and Blank sat down on a toilet in a stall. In rapid fashion, he leaps up and slams the bathroom door shut and locks it and grabs an old antebellum window shutter and breaks the glass and leaps out. All right. He said. I'm going to stop you right. real quick. Yeah. You're you're an officer, yeah, and you're this a, dude's taking a shit. The door slams and locks. What's going through your mind? Oh fuck! I'm about to lose my job. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you what. Yeah, I never. I I had so many bad guys, especially during the interrogations, et cetera. Uh, uh, that I, they a lot of times they would they they get nervous when they had to take a shit right before they give me a confession. And uh, you better believe every one of them. I stood in there with a the stall open and I listened to them shit and I watched them shit because yeah. I wasn't taking my eyes off of them. I mean, this dude killed six people, man, and and attempted to kill two more. Right? And he that's just the shut the lock the door about. on you, and he he slammed. That's the old shit moment. Unshackled, you know, yeah, yeah, unshackled, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, hey, you can you can poop with shackles on, yeah. Yeah, but, but they just fucked up on that one. No, no, no doubt about it. So the, <laughs> um, so he breaks the glass, y'all, and he jumps out. And the sheriff said, "Blank landed on the roof of a one story building adjacent to the courthouse, and then jumped to the ground." Sheriff's deputies outside the courthouse spotted him and chased him down. He, right, he didn't I can imagine they're, they're, right. they're seeing like, this dude jump yeah, on the right, ground, yeah. and they're like, uh, that's, yeah, they're like Holy, that's a serial killer. Oh, and my then, God. Uh, so he didn't get far, Wiley said. Blank was then put in the prison van and taken back to jail, Wiley said. The sheriff then called District Judge John L. Uh, Peg Tavin, who was conducting the hearing, and the judge asked that Blank be brought back to court to complete the proceedings. The judge's order was carried out, and the hearing, with Blank present, was conducted. The judge said he would study the motion to suppress Blank's confessions before issuing a ruling. So, y'all, this isn't a trial. This is one of the many motions to suppress and uh, all kinds of stuff that the defense tries to do. It's a free shot for the defense to find out what the prosecution has. But our article continues. It says, Later, Blank was examined at Prevost Hospital in Donaldsonville, where it was discovered he had broken a heel bone, the sheriff said. Blank was being treated for his injury at a state hospital that he declined to name. I don't want to blame it, the escape, on an antiquated courthouse, but we've always been at a disadvantage in that old courthouse, Wiley said. It has no bars on the windows. The reality is we have no inmate bathrooms, no inmate holding facility, but the primary cause was our inattention. You don't partially close the door on a murder suspect, the sheriff said. We had sufficient personnel, and our options were to tell him, you can't use the bathroom, but we're all sensitive to his constitutional rights, and they made the call to let him. They should have reshackled him or stayed on each side of him while he used the toilet, while he said the sheriff said he met with the warden of the parish prison and the supervisor of detail garden blank. And I'm looking at some administrative changes. Man. Somebody, <laughs> somebody's asking fire. Nobody was intentionally derelict, but I've got to make sure the people involved in garden blank are more attentive. The security detail will not be involved with such a defendant in the future. While he said, I hate this for the community and for the victims, survivors, the sheriff said. The last thing the public should have to worry about is this guy escaping. They should be able to rest comfortably knowing that my department is on top of it. Then what happened leaves a little bit to be desired. It shouldn't have happened, Wiley said. Blank's next court appearance is scheduled Wednesday when Judge Payton and Will hear arguments regarding evidence can be presented during the sentencing phase of the trial should he be convicted. Now, two things. <laughs> 
And and y'all, you know, it's obviously not funny. Thank God he was caught. But um, and I'm pretty sure somebody probably got shit canned over that right, deal. No doubt about it. Um, could you imagine being the one to have to call the sheriff? <laughs> Oh my god! I mean, I uh, bet they were all like, "I ain't calling him." No, right? The, uh, I mean, I've, we had it happen, uh, and that's what when, my second when, part of this was going to be. Gerald Bordelon and John Priest escaped, which are the two wars that we had in the Livingston Parish Jail at the time, and they left left them out on a walkway, like for their outside time. Mm-hmm. The, the walkway just has that uh, chain link fence, yeah, and. They had a cart, a maintenance cart they left from the hallway, and on the maintenance cart it had a pair of pliers. So when the, the guys in the control room aren't paying attention and there's nobody watching them from the other side, they got the pliers and and snipped the damn fence. Oh, and, my and God. ran and jumped over and got out. And yeah. y'all, one of these individuals on death row right, right yeah, well, now. Well, they, they, well well, one of them's dead uh, on death row. He's the last person executed in the state or, of Louisiana. Or, yeah. And, and John Priest um, – lured homosexual men into things and robbed them. But the last one he, he robbed, he just got out of jail that day. He robbed him and then pulled all his teeth. So, and then oh my set him God. on fire. So his body couldn't be identified. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, he's a bad dude. That dude's evil. So he's doing multiple life sentences, but, the, uh, he's but in bloody Angola. He's a bloody Angola. Sure. He is. Maybe I have to do a story one day. Yeah. Because yeah. he was a bad, he's a young kid too. Just fucking evil as fuck. And, oh, and, shit. Uh, so yeah, you know, I'm pretty sure you are going to have your hands on this cat at all time. Oh yeah. And, and, um, and so it, whoever that was didn't last long. I'm sure now, in any trial, uh, the defense is going to, you know, it's you might as well expect it. They're going to do profiles, right. psycholo- uh, or rather, um, they're going to get with psychiatrists right. and right. and right. these right. psychiatrists, right. Are, yes, do these evaluations. And and Daniel Blank was no different. And during the trial, as is standard with pretty much all your violent murder cases. Uh, he undergoes this evaluation with a psychiatrist and was diagnosed with what's known as schizoaffective paranoia disorder. Now, if you're if you're wondering what that is, it's a mental health disorder that is marked by a combination of schizophrenia symptoms such as hallucinations and delusions and mood disorder symptoms such as depression or mania. There are two types of of schizoaffective disorder, both of which include symptoms of schizophrenia. There are bipolar type, which includes episodes of mania and sometimes major depression, or depressive type, which includes only major depressive episodes. Uh, and they, you know, it affects people differently, according to psychiatrists. Um, it was also discovered that he had a learning dis- disability that hampered his verbal ability as well as his understanding of ad abstract concepts which is a fancy kind of like psychobabble jargon basically saying he didn't know how to deal with his emotions like a normal person well whatever cry me a fucking river right i mean about every i don't give a shit every, you killed six people every death penalty case we do they put on these you know the uh these ex so-called experts and they come up with with the same shit every time yeah but what they're trying to do is ultimately if he's found guilty, they're going to say, hey, look, here's a mitigating circumstance why he shouldn't be put to death because he, he doesn't think like the rest of us. And the death penalty phase, series one through ten, they did the same thing. Yeah, They, they brought in two different a neuropsychologist and a psychiatrist, and they said the same shit and whatever. Well, and and here's the the – the way I would, if I were a prosecutor, kind of poke bullshit in this whole thought process is in regards to his cognitive ability. Uh, I would say he probably had some upper level cognitive skills because that's cognitive ability. Y'all is the ability to problem solve. Basically, mm-hmm. this guy was a master mechanic. Yeah, I'm not, that's all about problem solving. Not only that, he he didn't leave any trace of himself at the the crime scenes. That shows planning and that he was smart like i said earlier that's right and and he wasn't but book smart as a matter of fact he only made it to the eighth grade he, his reading was on a third grade level they say but his iq was an 85 which is on the lower side of normal 
And IQ test, you know. Yeah, I'm sure that if I'm facing a death penalty, I can play dumb on an IQ test too. So, so they go through the trial, y'all, and uh, and eventually uh, they come back with a verdict, and that was the in. What we're going to read you now is the verdict for the Joan Brock case. And, uh, and you know, it was a, well, he was sentenced to death. So right. what do you, so this article is on April 11th of 2000 it says the jury took less than 45 minutes Monday to sentence Daniel Blank to death for the slain of Laplace housewife, Joan Brock on May 14th, 1997. Saturday, it took the same jury seven hours to find Blank guilty of the same murder. Wearing the same wrinkled blue work shirt, tan pants, and tennis shoes that he wore throughout the six-day trial, Blank showed no emotion as both decisions were read to him. On the other hand, during the reading of the death penalty decision, several of the jurors were weeping. I feel better now, said Douglas Brock, Wooder of Joan Brock, um, as he walked out of St. John. Baptist Courthouse in Edgar. I really do feel better. Brock's murder is one of the six attributed to Blank in a 10-month killing spree in 1996 and 1997. He allegedly broke into people's houses to steal money to feed a video poker gambling habit. During the burglaries, six people died. Blank has already been convicted and sentenced to death for the murder of Lillian and Philip uh, Philippe, 71, of Gonzalez. And it took 40th Judicial District Judge Sterling Snowdy and attorneys 26 days to pick an impartial jury in the Vols Parish. And yeah, you know, that's what they had to move it because of the publicity trial of Vols is way upriver. But Snowdy has ordered the jury selection in Marksville because he wanted to get the jury that was not tainted by the publicity surrounding all the homicides. The prosecution, led by St. John Parish Assistant District Attorney George Ann uh, Grognard, Present the jury with more than 25 pieces of evidence and 13 witnesses to prove the state's case against Blank. The centerpiece of the prosecution's attack was a four hour videotape of Blank's confession. Contained in the tape, a sometimes sobbing, sometimes cool Blank told detectives Todd Hemel of the St. John Sheriff's Office and Mike Tony of the Ascension Parish Sheriff's Office how he climbed over the fence of the Brock residence in the Riverland subdivision and hid for several hours in the backyard waiting for the box to leave that morning. When he thought the house was empty, Blank then tried several doors to gain entry into the house. Finding the back door unlocked, he entered and went straight to the bedroom where he knew the box kept the safe. As he was dragging the safe out of the house, he heard a sound, walked around, walked outside and surprised Joan Brock in the backyard. She screamed, and in response, Blank stabbed her four times with the butcher knife he had found in her kitchen. Blank then tried to drag Brock's body back into the house, but he couldn't manage it. He then rolled the safe out to his car in the garage and put the safe in the car, found the car keys in the kitchen, and fled. Blank took over $30,000 and jewelry from the safe. Wow. Yep. She was a nice woman, said a sobbing Blank in the videotape. I had nothing against her. She was a sweet woman. Blank, who was looking for money to feed his gambling habit, had worked for Douglas Brock as a mechanic several years before the murder. He felt that Brock had double-crossed him out of back pay, and he knew that there was money in the house. Blank's defense attorney, Glenn Cortello, tried to persuade the jury that Blank could not have lifted the 260-pound safe by himself. However, in a dramatic demonstration, Detective Hemel, dressed in a white jumpsuit, lifted the safe easily and placed it on a small cart. Smart. Right? That counteracts that. Later, in her closing statements, uh, Greg Nard said that Blank could also have easily levered the safe into the car by placing it against the back seat and lifting up. And and it's I don't mean to interrupt no, you, fine. but... This just occurred to me. This is someone who is used to lifting heavy things, yeah, uh, right. engines yeah, and things right. like that. I'm not saying he picked up engines yeah. by himself, but he's used to lifting yeah. dead weight. Yeah, well, and also he went there to get that son of a bitch, and, and he's going to get it out one yeah. way or another. And uh, you'd be surprised what you get and do after, after you just murdered somebody. And the defense only witness was the FBI polygraph expert David Sparks, who interviewed Blank before he made his um, – Confession to email and Tony. 
Cortillo argued that Sparks had coached Blank in the details of the murder prior to the videotape confession. Sparks admitted to telling Blank the time and the date of the murder and the description of the Brock house. Sparks added he told Blank where the body was discovered and the position of the body. He also told Blank what had been stolen from the house and that the safe had not been recovered. But on cross-examination, Ragnard showed that Sparks had not told Blank other important details about the case, such as the amount of money and the jury in the safe, where the car keys were, or how weeds and cigarette ashes were found in Brock's car after it was recovered. Douglas Brock had testified that he had just cleaned the car before the murder and that no one in his family smoked. During his tape confession, Blank gave specific instructions to the detectives where to find the safe he had dumped into the bayou about a mile from Sorrento. He also drew a detailed map of the Brock house with the descriptions of his actions. In the backyard near the house, he wrote, here's where I killed her with lar- with a large knife. And in closing arguments, Gragnar told the jury that there was specific intent when Blank killed Brock. When he heard her and saw her shadow, why didn't he just leave through the front door? Gragnar asked the jury. No, there was specific intent. He was not going to leave that house without mm. the money. He went out backland, surprised Joan Brock. He hacked her four times with a 20-inch weapon, Cortillo's closing. Cortillo's closing centered on the confession, insisting that the confession had been coerced from Blank and that Hymel had hypnotized Blank into confessing. So said, there is no scientific evidence whatsoever to connect my client to the crime except for the statement, said Cortillo. On rebuttal, Ragnar told the jury, not to be fooled by the smoke. Blank made his confession voluntarily without any pressure from detectives. During the penalty phase of the trial, several psychiatrists were brought in to testify that Blank does have a mild learning disability and brain dysfunction. But neither of the doctors said that these two factors would impair Blank from committing the crime or from knowing the difference between right and wrong. They said that there was no evidence of any psychosis. During the penalty phase, after conviction, the Brock family testified that the loss of Joan Brock had a devastating effect on the family. The jury was also told at that point about the other five homicides attributed to Blank, which shocked most of the jury since now he had ordered that no mention of the other crimes could be mentioned during the evidentiary phase of the trial. Blank still faces trial for the first degree murders of Victor Rossi of St. Amont, Barbara Bourgeois, Paulina, and Sam and Lori uh, uh, Luella, a curie of Laplace. After the sentence was passed, Joan Brock's daughters were asked if the sentence of death had helped their state of mind. And Stephanie Brock Sanchez said, We feel a little better about things, but it'll never be the same, added Stacy Brock Sardinia. We don't have a mother anymore. Wow. So that's powerful. And yeah. again, you know, that so what happened, um, like the psychiatrist and and the other crimes cannot be admitted as evidence of this dude being a badass during the guilt phase of the trial. All right. Yeah. And once they, they just the facts on, on that murder after that, when you go into the death penalty phase, that's when the guns come out, you can get to any prior criminal history uh, acts and statements and, and the facts show, showing that, Hey, this dude gets out, they're going to do it again. That's right. And, uh, so he did get sentenced to death, and and eventually, just to fast forward there, uh, he was convicted of uh, convicted and sentenced to death in that murder of Joan Brock, uh, Lillian Philippi. He was also sentenced to death by lethal injection for uh, the Arcuries. Uh, he took a plea on those and pled guilty to two counts of first degree murder and was sentenced to two irrevocable life sentences. Uh, so he was, you know, when it, when all the dust settled there, uh, he was convicted of, of everything he did, including two death sentences. Right. Uh, but there was a pro, you know, anytime you're dealing with the judicial system and especially when you get sentenced to the death penalty, uh, you can believe there's going to be, uh, 20 years of appeals right, and, and, 
uh, re-looking at evidence and fighting it. One of the reasons he took a plea on the other cases is because he figures it's easier to fight two death penalty charges and, uh, than it is to fight six. Yeah. And, and, and he was able to concentrate on those. Um, so he, you know, he, he gets sentenced to bloody Angola. He's right. serving his time. He's on death row. On death row, he's you know doing his appeals as is sadly standard, standard uh, these days. And uh, on February seventeenth of twenty sixteen, he was granted a stay of execution. Uh, and I'll just read you the quick article on that. A, a stay of execution has been granted for convicted serial killer Daniel Blank by the Louisiana Supreme Court on Wednesday. Convicted serial killer Daniel Blank, 53, as of that time, was scheduled to be executed on March 14th. However, officials with the Louisiana Department of Public Safety and Corrections stated they do not have the drugs necessary to carry out the execution. A stay of execution is court-ordered to temporarily temporarily suspend the execution of a court judgment or other court order. Uh, and it goes into, uh, you know, all of the people that he killed. Um, but they were having a problem with mm-hmm. with the drugs that they still, uh, they still supposedly do. have a problem yeah. with. Um, and so... Won't be a problem anymore. You know, Jeff Landry just got elected governor, and he's a very st- uh, pro death penalty. That's and right. He's, gonna, he's about to end all that. So he's still appealing, right? And right. and uh, and he got that stay of execution. And one of the things that he tries to work on these appeals is uh, is they were basically trying to say he was misled into why they wanted to meet in the first place, the police. Remember in in episode in the prior episode we told you that they went, meaning the detectives, went to Texas to formally interview him, I right. guess you could say. Um, and they released some of that transcript. And so I'll read you a little bit of that because it's interesting and uh, we'll get Woody's thoughts on it. So the detective says, do you think we traveled this distance to speak to you? about casino winnings. Uh, Do you think that's legitimately why we're here? And Daniel Blank says, well, basically, you wanted to know where I got all my money from, you know, and that's why I gave him the papers, uh, meaning the papers documenting the money he had won at the casino. The detective then says, well, we, we want both. Both of us took a good number of notes, and we've been speaking to you for about an hour and a half now. And Daniel Blank says, "Uh uh-huh. And the detective says, every single question that we asked you, we knew the answer to. And we do that for one reason, to see if you're going to lie to us. Sound accurate, Woody Everton? So it sounds like this detective knew what he was doing. Uh, Daniel Blank says, right. And the detective continues, there is a few points that you did, and there is a few things that you did uh, withhold from us. We're not going to ask you a question that we don't know the answer to already. Right. Danny Blank says, yeah. And the detective says, we've been doing this for far too long, and we're pretty good at what we do. And Daniel says, right. And the detective says, and we're not going to come here half-stepping, and I'm not going to travel five hours and come speak to you without having all my ducks in a row. Mm-hmm. The detective then says, okay, you have n- absolutely no idea why we're here. Uh, to speak to you. Is that what you're telling us? And Daniel says, uh, well, you want to know where I get my money from? And the detective says, have you ever been questioned or spoken to by any other sheriff's office in the past for any crimes that have taken place? And Daniel says, oh, I was called in about that deal about uh, Rossi. And the detective says, a Rossi homicide? And he says, yeah. And... um, and so that's that's uh, that's just kind of an example of how he was playing dumb. Yeah, he was. He knew. Right. He knew exactly why they were there. He's a the guy that killed these people. Right. Um, but he's totally playing stupid. But that's also a great example of detective work mm-hmm. that they were letting him know. We already know yeah, they, the answers to the questions. Were they're asking. establishing psychological control over him and preparing to cut off any 
uh, denials, et cetera. And, and that's one of the things you do. you got to immediately cut off his denials. You now you give them enough rope to hang themselves and say whatever. And but then they were like, mm, you weren't there. Bullshit. Right, and and uh, so then they continue on, and then it's the FBI agent. And if you remember in the last episode, he not only interrogated uh, uh, Daniel Blank, but he also did the polygraph. Right. So the uh, the FBI agent is talking to him, and he says, uh, "You bet it's okay." But something occurred, and you decided you wanted more in your life. You thought you could take it the easy way. You thought you could get some money from somebody. And Daniel Blank says no. And then the FBI agent says, and then something happened. And Daniel says, "Uh uh-uh. And then the FBI agent says, and when you went in there, and he's talking about Joan Brock's residence, when you went in there, oh, don't shake your head. I Uh, know you don't deny it, okay? cutting off the denials. Yeah, so the investigation has been going on for six months, son, okay? This didn't happen yesterday. We didn't just come down here in the middle of nowhere. Uh, we we want to know what's going on. We already know what's going on. What we're trying to figure out is why, because right. why this occurred is important. I don't know, Daniel Blank says, and then he says, I want you to tell me, Daniel, don't sit there and shake your head now. Come on. Let's be honest with each other, okay? Let's be honest with each other. It's time to have a meeting of the minds, okay? Mm -hmm. It's time for you to sit down and accept what you've done. Accept what you've done and let it go, okay? Mm -hmm. And Daniel Blank says, how can I accept something I ain't done? And he says, yeah, yeah, but you have. Mm -hmm. You did, okay? And I... When you say you can't accept something you hadn't done, that's good, okay? Because that means in reality, uh, you going, you you're going to say I can't accept I didn't do it because I did do it. That's what you're trying to tell me in your own streetwise way. That's what you're trying to tell me. Something happened. Something occurred in your life. 16 months, 18 months ago, something made you snap all the way to here. I don't think it was drugs. I think it was something you said, I have to take care of my family, and I have to take care of my family now. And the time has come for me to take care of my family. You decided there that you would take the easy way out. You didn't plan on hurting anybody, did you? Right, and then and giving a chance to So what do you face. think about that? I think it's genius. Uh, exactly what I you know, said, that you got to cut off any denials. You're establishing rapport. You're not totally going above as a board as ass yet because you don't want to scare them off. You know, look, a good homicide interrogation doesn't even start until after five hours. That's yeah. when you start to get the juice and wow. you start to break people down. I mean, people yeah. don't realize how long it takes them. One of the things I would have been said was uh, um, at a certain point, you know, you know if you stick in and, and you get them to change the story, blah, 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 and you stick in, I'd be like, mm, you know what, homie? Uh, the next time I ask you a question, if you feel like you have to lie to me, then don't say a fucking word because then you're gonna you're gonna insult my intelligence and and then I'm gonna have to insult you. Yeah, okay? and, and as you give them that thing, like let's stay on the same page. I can help you, but don't keep fucking with me. Right, and then uh, it, exactly, and another thing came out in uh, these appeals, and that was uh, obviously in the appeal one of the things that the police are trying to say is we knew he did it because he knew details that we never released to the public. Only the, the killer would have known about that. And when we interrogated him, he, he brought them up. So what he's going to read, uh, y'all a part of the interrogation where he's talking about miss, uh, Philippi's, uh, death and exactly what took place in that death that I I thought you might may find interesting. So, um, Daniel Blank says, Then I went back in and turned the light back on and started looking some more, and I didn't find anything, so I gave up on it. And when I come out, I turned the light off, and when I come out, that's when I saw something swinging at me. And the detective says, you saw something swinging at you? And Blank says, well, I saw a shadow of something. The light was off. The only light on was, I think, the bathroom light. And when I saw something coming at me with the shadow of the bathroom light and 
uh, just put my arm up, and then I grabbed it and um, pushed her. And uh, the detective says, when you say you saw something swinging at you, was it a person? Blank. Yeah, it was the woman swinging something at me. I don't know if it was a lamp. Um, I didn't see it. I just grabbed it, and it could have been a lamp. It could have been a trophy. It kind of felt more like a trophy. I I don't know if it could have been one of them little skimpy lamps. I don't know. And, well, that's when I pushed her. Pushed her, and um, then she comes at me with, a, I don't know if it was a knife or one of them letter openers or something. I don't remember what it was. I didn't see it. Dex says, she had it in her hand? Blank says, yeah, that's when I hit her with the thing I had in my hand, and then I grabbed it and I cut her with the knife. I don't remember where I cut her or at how I did it. It just happened so fast. Just I just freaked out then, and I left after that. Detective, all right, so you're saying while you was in the closet, you heard some noise, and you turned the light out in the closet? Blank says, right. Detective says, and then you wait a little while and you turn the light back on? And Blank says, no. I turned the light off when I heard a noise, and then I kind of opened the closet door and peeked out. And I didn't see anything or didn't hear anything, and I waited a couple seconds, and then I closed the door back and turned the light back on. And uh, then when I was ready to get out, after I had looked around, and uh, they had all kinds of stuff in there. I, I kind of emptied the drawers out and stuff like that and didn't find anything. And I just decided to leave. Tex says, okay. And Blank says, and th- then when I come out, that's when I turned the light off and opened the door and come out. That's when she was standing there, and uh, she had something in her hand and swung it at me. And Tex says, and you took it away from her? Blank says, I put, you know, my hand up like that and it hit me on the arm and then I grabbed it and pushed her on back onto the bed. And then she grabbed something off in of the table, something coffee table. And it could have been a knife or could have been one of them letter overs. I don't remember. The detective. OK. So when she went to grab this, you had this trophy. Blank says she come up. The text says or lamp in your hand. And Blake says, yeah, she come up and all I seen was like a shadow because I wasn't there. There was no light. And she was, the light was where I shined in front of the bathroom and the bathroom door wasn't all the way open. It was kind of cracked. And, uh, well, then she come back at me with the knife and, um, I tried to grab it, but I, I couldn't see her, her arm to grab it. And I just kind of ducked to the side and I hit her with the thing that I had, had in my hand. Well, the text says, what part of the body did you hit? And he says, I think it hit her in the head. I ain't sure. And Blank says, I think that's where I hit her. And the text says, and what did she do? Blank says, well, after that, I pushed her, and then I grabbed her hand with a knife, and I know I cut her. I don't know where, but uh, the text says, was she standing up when you cut her? Or, and Blank interrupts and says, no, she was laying on the, I think she was, she had, when I pushed her, she was laying across the bed or at the edge of bed. And um, after that, I did that, and I, then I left. And Tex says, but you hit her with the knife, too, then? Blank says, yeah. And Tex says, okay, you left. Blank says, I, uh, I grabbed her arm or hand or something and went back with it. And then I took the knife, and I ain't positive, but I think I hit her twice with it. I ain't sure. I don't remember. It just happened so fast. And I was just scared, and I just took out and left. So... Now you're gonna know all those details. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you and didn't I, do it. Wait, wait, I, I call it that. It said that tells me this guy's smart. He's actually replaying in his mind. Mm-hmm. He's seeing. It's not like he's reading the script. He's like, oh yeah, that's right. Because the bathroom light was on. It wasn't this light, right? It was the yes. bathroom light. And then I saw something coming at me, and it tried to freak me out. And I grabbed it. And I don't know if it was a lamp or it was a trophy, maybe. And and but he's think. He, He's not totally clear on everything, but he knows enough. Like I said, so she was standing when you stabbed her, and he's like, no, no, she was laying on the bed. Yeah. Why would you say that? Right. Why would you make that up? And, and the, the detective questioning him, you know, he – he already knows where she was stabbed and all these things. What he's, what you're, I would imagine what you're doing at this point is trying to build a case. Trying so to get you, him to confirm, you're proving that he knew. Confirm the, the evidence that you have. Yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, good job by them. And right. then, uh, you know, one other thing that came up 
on the appeal and a good thing to ask you, Woody, is the polygraph itself. And and uh, and Daniel Blank tried to say that, you know, he didn't know he could get out of a polygraph. Yeah, that's they, and they, you have polygraph rights. They read the tea before every exam. There you go. And and here was just a short conversation that took place between him and and uh, the detectives when they asked him to submit to a polygraph. Daniel Blank, what choice do I have? Detective, well, it it's your choice. I mean, uh, and then the other detective says, it's your choice. And Daniel Blank says, if I refuse it, then what? And the detective says, that's your prerogative. I mean, this is something that we ask you before uh, if you're responsible for committing to these homicides and you stated no. And Daniel Blank says, I mean, if I refuse it, then what are y'all going to do to me? And the detective says, well, I got to be honest with you. If you're looking from a investigative standpoint, it doesn't look too good. I mean, but that's only my opinion. I mean, that's just my opinion. Right. Uh, Daniel Blank says, well, what I'm saying is if I refuse to take the polygraph, what are you going to do? You're going to arrest me? And the detective says, you're not under arrest. So it, right, right. you they, have they that conversation, which recorded. Right. That proves they right. they're telling you they're not threatening to right. arrest they you. They never threatened. They're just they, saying they, they don't look he, good he if keeps, you refuse. And it's, it, it didn't. They well, they weren't lying about that. Let me tell you something. Getting people past, giving permission for the polygraph is probably the hardest thing to do, especially the guilty people. Yeah. Now, there's two kinds of people who take the test: the ones who take it because they know they can pass it, and the ones who take it like Daniel Blank because they know their ass is in a crack and they're hoping by some miracle that you know they'll show. A no deception indicated. That's right. And and so long story short, he exhausts his appeals and now he's in a position where he is just awaiting uh his death. Oh, it's coming. In bloody bloody and gone. He's on the row. And guess what? He was one of the ones um that did this recent clemency push or whatever uh f- push for clemency hearings. But uh you know Time is up, and the, the new sheriffs in town, per se, with Jeff Landry coming in, because he's the one that's been fighting the governor to about, and the governor basically in the end came out and said he, he didn't believe in executions and all that. But I'm going to give a shout-out to investigators, Sheriff Jeff yes. Wiley, Ascension Paris. Look, great guy. Um, I actually did my internship my for my polygraph license uh they, they had a certified polygraph examiner by this time, uh, Greg Landry, and Jeff Wiley had to prove it. I had to go over there every week and stuff and work with this, uh, one of his detectives uh, who yeah. was a, a polygraph guy. Look, in the Central Parish Sheriff's Office, one of the best, one of the best, uh, um, equipment-wise and training-wise and everything else. And Mike Tony was has been there forever. He might, he's might he got to be retired now, but I knew him and worked cases with him. Uh, but he was a lead investigator on the case in uh, for Ascension Parish. And then Willie Martin, uh, who is the sheriff of St. James Parish, a great guy, shout out. And Sid Berthelot was the first responding officer in St. James Parish, shout out to him. And Todd uh, Hamel was the lead investigator for St. John Parish, shout out. I mean, not that often they get to work these. And C.J. Destor was the investigator for St. John Parish who assisted. And Dal Bryn, the investigator for the Gonzales Police, I don't, I don't believe he's there any longer. Um and Dan Funk, who was the FBI special agent, they, they, these guys brought probably one of the most prolific serial killers you never heard about. Absolutely. And yeah. uh, so shout out to the just amazing detective work by a lot of those guys and and uh, and something very admirable. If you know any of those guys and, and they're still around and, and uh, would like to do an interview with us. We'd love to have yeah. him on, sit down and talk to him. I, I think Sheriff Wiley is a senator now, the, uh, or a senator or congressman or something. Not a congressman, but I saw him uh, at the Chamber of Commerce when I did it, the Chamber of Commerce. And, oh, did you? Yeah, he was he was with Jason, okay. uh, uh, Sheriff Ard. And, well, that'd and, be and great J- if we could get him you on. remember uh, – uh, Jeff Wiley, I said, Sheriff, yeah, I remember. And I told him <laughs> about the polygraph thing. He laughed, and he was out in Caitlin Adel's case and all the all the big cases yeah. over the years. But he's since retired, and moved on. You know, our, we want to remember the victims yes. that of these cases, and yeah. and I'm sure there's a lot of family, family out there that yeah, are listening to this right now. Right. Yeah. Matter of fact, I know one in particular that her, her cousin was involved in this. So shout out to you, um, and Victor Rossi. 
Barbara Bourgeois, Lillian Philippi, Sam Akuri, Luella Akuri, Joan Brock, all murdered. Uh, but you're in our thoughts and prayers and your families. Yeah, it's a ripple effect in time. Someone's murdered. That people just hear the headline of the, of the murder victims, but it, every one of them have families. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, Leon's and Joyce Millet, who yeah. uh, who were not killed, they were su- survivors. And I'm sure they have family still out there. I don't- yeah, and patron members, thank you again for your support. Y'all go to patreon.com and type in Bloody Angola. Um, we've got a bunch of different levels, a bunch of different you know, ways that things that you can get for showing us support the Patreon. If you can't be a Patreon member, we get it. We love and appreciate all y'all. Please go leave us reviews and like and share and, and help us continue to grow. Hey, and we are for 2023 Bloody Angola. Bloody Angola won the best history podcast in the world. In the world. Because of y'all. You rock. Because of y'all. That's right. And uh, and we appreciate that so much. So until next time, I'm Jim Chapman. I'm Woody Everton. Your host of Bloody Angola. A podcast 142 years in the making. Complete story of America's bloodiest prison. Peace. Peace. I walk a straight line, shackled and chained. Oh, gruesome Gertie is calling my name. There is no mercy in this penitentiary. Just ask the Hill String Gang, Rango.